Welcome again to Student of the Word. We are talking about the prayers of Paul, and today we're going to talk about a prayer for your calling. Every believer has a calling on his life, but usually doesn't find it until a few years later. Then it's up to you to make the most out of it and pray for others with a calling too. We're going to talk about that today out of the prayers of Paul. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello, and I welcome you today to Student of the Word. Glad to have you with us today. And I know there's many of you that are watching and been following this series that I've been teaching on, and that is on the subject of prayer. And what we're offering is a flash drive on the subject of prayer. And we know that'll be a great blessing for you. This is not only the prayers of Paul that I'm teaching right here, but other prayers found in the New Testament that I know will be a great blessing to you because we can learn from everybody the power of prayer. And it seems like so often in the Christian life, we wait till we get older to start really praying because by then, our legs don't work as good as they used to. I'm not saying you're sick. I'm just saying there's a, that's part of you that gets old. And your hands can't do what they used to do. And so we suddenly turn to prayer. But we should actually develop a prayer life all the way along with that because God is not only to call us to go to some place, lay hands on the sick, uh, walk with our feet somewhere, but also he's called us to pray. And uh, we find out so often in the Word of God, too, that a lot of your prayers won't be answered until after you're gone. Jesus' first statement on the cross was a prayer. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And uh, that wasn't answered until he died. When he died, they accept him as Lord and Savior. This must be the Son of God. So there's also prayers that have been prayed throughout the Old Testament that are still being accomplished today and will not be culminated until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, we just want you to know the power of prayer. You don't have to be somewhere. You don't have to lay hands on somebody because prayer can pray for them. And we need this in our calling. Every one of you have a calling. If you're born again, you have a call on your life. And you say, yeah, but I'm not a pastor and evangelist. You may not be. There's five of those offices, but there's also found in Romans chapter 12, seven other offices that fulfill the rest of the body of Christ. Those could be deacons. Those could be others that work in the church, but they're also known in that verses of scripture as givers, exhorters. And so there's all different types that we all work together. And whether we be visible members of the body of Christ or those in the background, we still all work together. Look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Today I'm going to talk about your calling. I'm going to talk about a prayer for your calling. And part of your responsibility is to pray for the callings on other people. I meet so many people, you know, pastors especially, some of them kind of get this arrogant attitude, like I'm the one in town, I'm the one that's going to bring the city to the Lord. And listen, even pastors work together, evangelists work together. No one pastor is called to change the whole town. We need different pastors with different viewpoints. I look at the Word of God much like a, a diamond, that when the light hits it, all those facets can make different colors and brilliance and things like that. And that's the way it is. You can look at a verse of scripture. There's so many facets to that verse of scripture, but it often takes a calling to see that facet of it. I mean, when I minister on a verse, I teach it from a teacher's viewpoint. I want the people to learn from that. But I've seen others take a verse of scripture and that are called to be evangelists, and they'll get a simple plan of salvation out of that verse I never saw before. But why? It took the calling in them to see that in that verse of scripture. So today we're going to talk about your calling. I'm not telling you what you're called to do. If you don't know what you're called to do, God will reveal it to you. But for those of you who know what God has called you to, whether be you be young in the ministry, mature in the ministry, or older in the ministry, it still comes back to this, God has a plan for you. And thank God you can pray for your calling and others can pray for your calling. Second Thessalonians chapter one is where I want to take a look at in verses 11 and 12. And here Paul makes a prayer for the calling of the Thessalonian people. And that of course comes to us too. In second Thessalonians chapter one, verses 11 and 12, therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us have a calling. And your calling may be the same as a pastor down the street or a teacher or an evangelist or whatever it may be. But God is simply saying here, he wants all of us to be glorified in that calling, but also we do the same thing. And that's all of us, no matter what we're called to do, the viewpoints we take on a verse of scripture, the angles we come at it with might be unique to us, but you know what? It all does one thing. All of us are out to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, not build ourselves up, not to build a, a ministry for ourselves. We operate in the ministry that God has given 
given to us. And the most important thing is following the voice of the Lord. This prayer that Paul prayed in this verse of scripture is preceded by resting in the Lord until Jesus Christ comes. In other words, we often get this idea like pastors, man, we got to change our country around. We got to change the world. We're going to change the world. Well, you can get people saved. You can get people born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, other things. But I can tell you this, you're not going to change the entire world. Jesus will do that. And that should be part of the rest that we have in the Lord. We get attacked by so many things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. But God hasn't told us we're going to conquer the world. We're not going to conquer the flesh, but we do have authority over Satan. And we need to rest in the fact that we have authority over Satan, the works of the devil, but we do not have authority over the world. We can't cast the world out of the world. We don't have the power over the flesh. You can't cast your own flesh out, much less of the uh, flesh of unbelievers or even other Christians that come against you. You do have authority over sickness, disease, disease. You do have authority over demon possession and the works of the devil in your life. And that's why God has told us to rest. And this is what God is telling them to do in the areas that you can't change. Rest in the Lord. Jesus will handle that. I see all the things happening around us today in the world and know that the end times are so close. Man, I just love to get out there and just, just take some of these leaders in government and just, you know, shake them and tell them, don't you know that there's a day coming of judgment? when the world will be judged, individuals will be judged. And you know what? You know what the attitude of many of them is, I don't care, or I don't believe that, you know, you're just wrong. And they've got their own agenda. But the point of it is God knows what their agenda is. And Jesus has an answer for it. Rest in that and do what God has called you to do. Well, what has God called you to do? Win souls is number one. When's the last time you won a soul? If you're as diligent about winning souls as you are trying to change our government, then uh, listen, the world should be born again by now. But the point of it is it comes back to this. Do the main thing God has called you to do. And the number one thing he's called you to do is, is fulfill the Great Commission. And that is evangelize. Then get them filled with the Holy Spirit. Then get them mature in the things of God. Make disciples out of them. And this means by going to church. Because even the disciples in their day, they shook their nations, but they didn't change their nations perpetually. It came back to the nation that it was later on. And we see revivals temporarily changing nations. But what we're after is the people in the nation to cause more churches, to cause more people to be saved and things like that. The one that's going to finally yank Satan off this planet the one that's going to change all the governments of the world will be the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we're to rest in that. Second Thessalonians, we're here in chapter one. We looked at verses 11 and 12. Go back with me. We're going to take a look at verses six through 10. In verse six, Paul says, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation, those who trouble you, he says, the ones that are troubling you are going to run into trouble themselves. Those trying to put tribulation on you from this world are going to run into great tribulation themselves. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. He will guard his ministers. Even if you're killed and and slaughtered in the midst of of this uh, upheaval in our world today, understand something. You're going to be taken to heaven, but there will be somebody to replace you here. Satan never will. Satan never has won over the body of Christ. The body of Christ stands secure and God's going to take care of it. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail again. He doesn't say they won't try to prevail. He doesn't say we will never go through troubles. He just said they will not win in the end. He will win in the end. Vengeance is the Lord's. He guards his people. He guards his ministers. And we don't have to pay back evildoers. God will do a much better job than we could ever do. So the point of it is until Jesus comes, be patient. No matter how bad the world seems to be getting, be patient. We are then free to continue fulfilling God's call on our lives. And with God, payback is righteousness. With us, it is revenge. So let the Lord pay back in righteousness and not us in revenge. God doesn't need revenge, hasn't called us to get revenge. He's the one that will ultimately pay back. And God's payback will come during the church age, the coming tribulation, and finally at Armageddon and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So literally, there's times that the world is going to face Jesus 
Jesus Christ face to face, and he's not going to use armies from heaven to defeat them, although armies will be present. He's going to destroy all the evil of the world with the words of his mouth. He's going to speak and out will come a sharp two-edged sword. And in that day, they're going to find out just how powerful one person can be. His name is Jesus Christ. Verse 7 goes on to say, and to give you who are troubled rest along with us. When the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, this is his second coming. This is his kingdom to be established in this earth. We are to stay in rest, even though the world is troubled around us. We are to stay at rest because Jesus himself is going to come back and he will settle the problems of the world. Listen, is it important to vote? Do it. It's part of your civic duty. Is it important to pray for leadership of your nation? I can even point you scriptures in Ephesians that tell you to pray for the leaders of your nation, but it's not up to you to change them. It's up to you to pray. It's up to you. If God calls you into government, my Lord, get into government. We can use as many Christians in government as possible. But don't get this idea you're going to change the entire nation around, all the governments around. That is in the hands of the Lord. And the government will be upon his shoulders one day, not on the shoulders of the Democrats, the Republicans, or whoever else is in office at the time. So all that is left for us to do is rest in God's promises until he returns. And Paul uses himself as an example for this, as he did with them. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. He says, you should take the same care for other ministers as a father does for his own children, just like God does for his own children. And those who are born again out from under you and those even called into the ministry, it demands your prayer for them and care for them, not your griping and complaining because they don't agree with every doctrine that you do. And on top of that, Jesus will straighten all of us out, including you. When we get to heaven and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So we are to be followers of others and imitators of God. Pick yourself some great ministers, followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This has told us in Hebrews chapter 11, this is what we are to do. So believers can rest in the church age and in the tribulation that God will recompense believers who are under pressure and attack from the world. So there's going to be believers and people getting born again throughout the church age. Then there's going to be people born again throughout the time of the tribulation. There'll also be people that'll be born again during the time of the millennium, but there'll be no Satan here to come against them. In the meantime, with Satan on the earth during the church age, and Satan under great attack and causing great attack during the time of the tribulation. God says he will take care of us. What are we supposed to do? Stay on track. Keep preaching the word of God and making disciples of everybody that accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior. Raise up churches, lay hands on the sick, see the power of God begin to operate and trust him for the supernatural and trust him that through the supernatural, people are going to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and realize the ultimate victory is not going to come from you. It's going to come from Jesus Christ coming back to earth. Jesus' second coming is the ultimate victory on earth of righteousness over persecution. I'll see you right after the break. In Ephesians 6, 18, the expanded translation says, praying always at all times with all prayer, different kinds of prayer and supplication, that is praying in the spirit. The prayer flash drive presents a biblical explanation of each type of prayer found in scripture, including praying in the spirit, binding and loosing, the prayer of consecration, the prayer of agreement, the prayer of faith, and many more. The flash drive also includes a series on the power of prayer and the prayers of Paul. In studying the prayers of Paul, you will learn that Paul rarely prayed for his own needs. He mainly prayed for others, especially for believers. The prayer flash drive contains 37 MP3 audio lessons by Bob Yandian, a topical study on prayer. To order the prayer flash drive, visit our website at bobbyendian.com. Have you ever wondered why some Christians who are obviously called and anointed by God never seem to move into the realm of success? We watch and wonder as they struggle, knocking on doors that never open, while others have opportunities knocking at their door. Why are so many called, but so few chosen? God has a ministry for everyone, and He rewards those who are faithful to His call. 
Learn the keys to finding and walking in God's purpose for your life with Bobby Indian's book, Calling and Separation. The Calling and Separation book is available for $10 plus shipping and handling. To order your copy, visit our website at bobbyendian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. When Jesus comes back at His second coming, angels are going to accompany Him. There'll be one angel accompanying Him at the rapture of the church, the voice of the archangel, and will rise to meet Jesus. But seven years after that, when the tribulation is over, Jesus is going to come back with millions of angels and with millions upon millions of believers that were saved throughout the church age. And so we'll come back with the Lord Jesus Christ. Angels will accompany Jesus and they will separate the righteous from the wicked. This is found in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 4 and Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31. So they will separate the wicked from the just. The just will stay on the earth and enter into the millennial reign of Jesus, but the unjust, those who have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior, will be separated from them and they'll be cast into hell throughout the time of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, then raised from that place, go through the great white throne judgment, and on the other side of the great white throne judgment, they'll be cast into the lake of fire forever and forever. This is what Jesus referred to when he talked about the baptism of fire. Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 tell us this. Jesus was being baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. He said, I indeed baptize you in water and repentance, but he who comes after me is mightier than I whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you believers with the Holy Spirit and with fire, that's unbelievers, whose winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat, that's believers, into the barn, that's the coming kingdom. But he will burn up the chaff, that's unbelievers, with unquenchable fire, that is hell and eventually the lake of fire. That's found in Matthew 25 and verse 46. So believers will be separated from unbelievers. That's where he'll stand there and put the sheep, that's the believers, on one, on his right hand and the goats on his left hand. And he'll separate the goats and remove them from the earth. And all that will be on the earth at the beginning of the millennium will be believers only. Now, many people would be born during the time of the millennium, but they still have to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And many of them don't. Now, your first thought is, but how can they receive Jesus if there is no devil, no demons, and no curse on the earth? Because as they're still born with the nature of the flesh. That will not be removed until we all have a resurrection body one day. But in the meantime, again, God will separate them. Again, wheat from chaff. That's the tares. The wheat represent believers. The chaff represent unbelievers. He'll separate good fish from bad fish. Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. He'll separate the good fish from the bad fish, and the good fish are believers. The bad fish are unbelievers. He'll separate the good and the bad virgins. Matthew 25, the good virgins represent those who have been uh, saved and the bad virgins represent those who have not been saved. You say, what's the difference between a good virgin and a bad virgin? A good one is saved, a bad one is not. And the virgins that are not saved are those who practice religion that looks like Christianity, but again, it is not and he'll know the difference between the two. In verse 8, we continue on. It says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's where the vengeance of the Lord comes that we cannot do. We cannot separate believers from unbelievers and destroy all unbelievers. There's days you'd like to. And in fact, there's probably some Christians you'd like to just get rid of in your church. But you know what? It still comes back to this. It's up to us to preach the gospel. It's 
It's up to us to make disciples of them. It's up to them to receive it. Not all will receive it. When we preach the gospel, not all receive it. But those who do receive it, to them he gives power to become the children of God. To those who don't, they might have another opportunity or more in this lifetime. But if they continue to reject, they will find themselves in hell and eventually one day the lake of fire. So this is where again, verse 8 says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, when Jesus Christ comes back, separating believers from unbelievers, at the time of his coming on the earth to rule and to reign, this is after the tribulation has ended. At that time, Jesus is going to do a much better and a much thorough job than you could ever do. In flaming fire will be a sword that will come from his mouth and destroy his enemies. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16 tell us this. Then in verse 9, it goes on to say, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So there is everlasting destruction. There's so much being taught today that hell is only temporary or does it really exist? It does exist and it is not temporary. It is eternal. And it says again, they will go into everlasting destruction. And so that's what this verse is talking about. So we will go into everlasting life in heaven. Those who've rejected Jesus will go into everlasting destruction. As it says from this verse, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The enemies of the Lord, that sinners who have rejected the gospel will have an eternity in the lake of fire. All unbelievers will be removed from God's glory that abides in heaven and on earth during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So everyone that starts the millennium will be believers. All unbelievers have been removed at the end of the tribulation. But those born during the millennium, there'll be many, many millions who reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. In fact, Satan is released at the end of the millennium and gathers together a gigantic army of unbelievers on the earth and they rebel against God. Notice this. They rebel against a perfect world government, a perfect world leader. They rebel against righteousness. There is no sin in this earth. There's no distraction of any kind that God doesn't take care of and Jesus doesn't take care of, but there's still some who will reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. They still think they can do a better job and they fall under Satan's category. And Satan is released before the end of the millennium, just for a very short season, takes all these people and goes against God one more time to destroy destroy Jesus and destroy this kingdom down here. And God simply wipes it out in a very short amount of time. And that's when all of those who have rejected Jesus throughout all of history will stand before the great white throne judgment. And those names not found written in the Lamb's book of life are cast into the lake of fire. Hell is merely a waiting place for the lake of fire. Verse 10 goes on to say, when he comes in that day, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all who believe because our testimony among you was believed, he went on to say here. And when we give our testimony and those receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, he'll be glorified in them when he comes back because they are saints. He'll be admiring them, all who believe. And also on that day, he'll separate them from the unbelievers and the unbelievers will go to hell for a thousand years to eventually go into the lake of fire forever and forever. There's no no good in rejecting Jesus as Lord and Savior. The great good comes because you've accepted him as your Lord and your Savior, and he will be with you and you'll be with him forever. Jesus does not ultimately come to remove unbelievers, but to reward and be glorified in believers that are on the earth. He has to remove the unbelievers at a point, but that's not the reason he comes back. He comes back because he's glorified in those who have received him as Savior. He will be glorified in that day in the people from all generations who have believed in the gospel. And that will be what we do. We'll believe in the gospel. Let's talk about a prayer for our calling. Again, as believers, we're all called. We all have a calling on our life. If you haven't found your calling, just open up your heart and say, Lord, at the right time, reveal to me what my calling is on my life. In fact, when it comes, you'll probably think, wow, it's like I've known that all the time. 
He doesn't throw surprises at you. When I was called to be a teacher, it's because I love teaching, but I never thought I'd be called to be one. I just loved it. And this is the way it is in the Christian life. There's certain things you love to do. And often I've heard Christians say, well, I don't want to do that. I mean, that's, I like that, but I want what God wants for me. Well, maybe God put the like in your heart. Maybe the, the delights that's in your heart came from God in the first place. And you'll find out one day, this is what your true calling is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at chapter one there again. Let's take a look at verses 11 and 12. And here's what Paul says again. Therefore, we also, not only is there prayer going on for you among believers, believers are praying for you, but also we also, that's Paul and his team. We also pray for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling. We want you to live a life that displays your calling. None of this secret stuff behind the scenes. What God wants is transparency in your ministry and you believe and live for the Lord and then practice what you believe and practice what you live. God wants you to walk as a disciple, be a disciple, fulfill that call on your life. And he says in that verse of scripture goes on that, God, that he prays for us that God will fulfill fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. This always was every time Paul prayed for the Thessalonians. He always mentioned in prayer those that received Jesus under his ministry, that they would continue in the ministry, grow in the ministry, and be living examples for the Lord. He prays for those who had believed his testimony. The Lord can only complete his plan in those who will rest in his promises and leave vengeance in the hand of the Lord. No matter which office you're called to, your highest calling is to win souls and make disciples of them. He goes on to say here in verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. When you walk in your calling, when you rest in your calling, when you become greater in your calling, all the time growing more and more in it, more mature in it. It says the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified in you and you become glorified in him. God will exalt you when you put him first. God will exalt you when you put your ministry above anything else in life that you're going to fulfill it. And according to the plan of God, he says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be ones that God will have great glory in when the kingdom arrives on earth. And this is what will happen. My, my troubles, my fights are all temporary, but the glory that's going to be revealed in me when Jesus Christ comes back to rule and reign on the earth will be eternal. And what he's saying here in this verse of scripture, again, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to be the ones that God will have great glory in when the kingdom arrives on earth. I want him to say to me, well done, good and faithful servants. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over much. So we are also glorified in him when we trust his promises and confidently and patiently wait for him to fulfill it. There's many things we'll see fulfilled in our lives. Others we're going to die and won't see them fulfilled, but they will be fulfilled. Prayer is something that answers to prayer can still come after we are gone. We still see many of the prayers of the Old Testament still being fulfilled today. Even Abraham didn't see all the promises God had for him. He died in faith. And so this is truly trusting in God's grace for today and God's grace for the future. What am I simply saying? Take the call of God you have on your life and do everything you can to give glory to God through it. Walk in honesty, walk in transparency toward the world. Let them see Jesus Christ in you as well as hearing it from your lips and God will see to it you're rewarded for it. Have a great day. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.